Oh baby, you so juicy. Juicy, yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I slice, slice? You like the way I work you out. Well. I don't mind if you tease me now. My lady, you deserve a crown now. Yeah. I like it when you take it to the ground. Do your dance, mommy. Yes. Honey, I like the way you work for me. The way you move your ass got me going down. You got it, girl, you got it. This is JP with the BBC Podcast, back with another interview. Let this lovely lady introduce herself. Yeah, hi, I'm Caitlin V. I am a sex and relationship coach, uh, YouTuber, and the host of the show Good Sex on Discovery Plus and Max. All right, all right, all right. So what got you into that genre? I actually knew from a really early age that I was going to help people to have better sex. Mm-hmm. Like, I went through public school. Uh, I grew up in Michigan. And, you know, I remember seeing, like, the giant pictures of genitals with, like, syphilis and lesions. <laughs> and, like, yeah. you know, the conversation in sex ed is typically, like, about all of the things that can go wrong with sex and none of the things that can go right and none of the reasons that people have sex to begin with. Mm-hmm. And so I knew because I was like a curious kid, I figured out how to masturbate early, that there was more to sex than like disease and pregnancy. Uh-huh. And so even when I was like 14, 15, I knew that I was going to help people to actually enjoy the nice things about sex, mm-hmm. the pleasurable things about sex. Yeah. Uh, and so I've just followed that path. I went to... Uh, get a degree. I have a master's in public health. I started my doctorate, um, and I eventually left that to coach people so that I could work with them one on one. Okay, okay. So, w- when did you, let's say, classify yourself as a sex expert? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think I classified myself as a sex expert when I started really identifying as an educator, mm-hmm. I was working with young people and youth and like homeless youth and LGBTQ youth, but I never actually got credentialed. Yeah. Like, I kept trying to get credentialed. I kept trying to work for like an official, you know, legitimate sex education opportunity, like mm-hmm. in government or in schools. And I was always getting turned down. Like I even got turned down to work at a sex toy shop. <laughs> and, but I knew it was my calling. So I just kept pushing, right? I was like, yeah. well, I'm going to do this anyway. And, uh, and like just, I think two years ago, I applied to be officially, I'm now a certified sex educator, but I already have like 70 million views on YouTube. I've already, you know, been coaching for years. I'm already a certified sex and relationship coach. So anyone listening, like if, if it's your dream job and you keep being told no, like just keep going because you get to make your own way. Cool, cool, cool. So what was, did they give you a reason why they turned you down from the, uh, the sex store? I think I did not know enough about toys. I think they wanted someone who was like really well versed in sex Mm -hmm. toys. But my thing was like, I'm a quick learner. Like, put me in, I'll learn. Like, I'll I'll, I'll know about materials and silicon and da da da. And I made a mistake. I like, I thought you could clean sex toys using like Lysol at the time. Turns out it's not true. Um, So I think I probably made myself look like I did not know what the heck I was doing. See, as a guy, I would just assume soap and water. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then they make a special spray which has triclosan in it. That's the sex toy cleaner that you see at the store. So it has like a hospital grade uh, antibacterial antiviral on it. So you shouldn't breathe it in. Like you should be careful when you're using it, but mm-hmm. it will clean a sex toy and silicon sex toy shouldn't be shared because they can still harbor bacteria and viruses even after being cleaned. But they did call me like a year later and offer me the job. And I was like, are you kidding? Like I'm done. <laughs> they probably seen your page and was like, oh shit, no, she's she actually knows what she's doing. Yeah, 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 she does, turns out she does know she's doing. And you know what, I still don't identify as a sex toy expert. Like, I know a lot more than most people, but there are mm-hmm. people who know, you know, about the, the, the grades, the materials, that are, like, really hip on what's coming out. And mm-hmm. what's like, I, I know, and I'm like, I know more than the average person, but it's not, it's still not my area of expertise. So, so how important do you think it is for people to, say have knowledge of what good sex is and what to do, what not to do. and I mean, I guess it depends on how much happiness and joy you want to have in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, sex and it feeling like uh, I have an easy, joyful, fun, pleasurable relationship with sex. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter about, like, who I'm having sex with or if it's by myself or whatever. Like, 
having a great relationship with sex itself is part of what makes life enjoyable, what makes life worth living. I think a lot of people just struggle with sex. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they fully realize the impact that that has on us. Because, you know, our bodies are meant to have sex, right? We're meant to sleep, eat, and fuck. That is, that is what we are genetically yeah. programmed to do. After that, everything else is just kind of a bonus. Yeah. Right? So if you're not sleeping well, your life quality of life goes Sucks. down, right? <laughs> if you're not eating well, your quality of life goes down. So I think we should treat sex with the same kind of uh, reverence as we do food and sleep. So what do you consider good sex? Like for me personally? Do you have to have good foreplay to have good sex? Do you, is there is there levels to it? What do you what would you what no, if, I actually don't think I think I've had great sex without any physical contact, you know? Interesting. Uh, uh, I think we should define great sex mm -hmm. as when Let me think that's a good question. What would be the definition of great sex? Or even good sex. I would say something that is erotically stimulating and, and leaves you better than when you started. Okay. And with that definition, like you can have great sex over video or over chat or over text or across a room with someone. Mm -hmm. Like you could be, you could really have like a great, like erotically charged experience. And when I say erotic, I really mean like everything having to do with the merging of two things and the pulling apart of two things. So mm -hmm. like, you can have a great sexual experience with yourself because you're having this, like, a merging with something that's bigger than you, which is, like, pleasure and satisfaction mm -hmm. and even be a spiritual thing. Okay, okay. So, I was scrolling through your videos, and, I mean, I'm sure there's a, a, a lot of guys out there that would like to know if it's true, if it actually works. And would you recommend it on the, um, and you got a lot of views, you almost, you like pretty much went viral with it. Um, let's see, proven ways to increase your penis size, length yeah. and girth. So yeah. let, let the, let the audience know, like, does it actually work? Can you actually achieve that? So yes, you actually can. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a little bit of work. There's a couple different methodologies for getting increase in size length width. I recommend in that video the bath mate, which is a penis pump that actually uses warm water. You use it in the shower or in the bath. I have a discount with Caitlin 10, I think is my discount. So if you go to bathmate.us slash Caitlin V, you'll get my like landing page, my video where I explain more about it and you can get, I think, 10% off. The reason that I like this, I used to recommend a different system, and the different system which used like pulleys and it used uh, uh, like massage techniques that you would have to do on yourself every single day. It would sometimes take like 30 minutes a day, mm -hmm. right? And then it was painful for some people, uh, the like later stages were actually like pretty, pretty intense. Uh, and you're stretching the skin of your penis and you're like having to constantly apply pressure to it. That system I think is a little bit uh, outdated because what the bath mate does is compared to like so we know other penis pumps right like they typically use air to create a vacuum the bath mate uses warm water and because of that your skin your flesh like the cells of your body your tissue is actually a lot more elastic so it can stretch with a lot more ease without mm -hmm. injury mm -hmm. right and you only do it for a few minutes it doesn't take all that long and then you uh and then you massage so you massage the tissue to help it to 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 grow and to have flexibility and pliability the reason I started recommending the bath mate was actually for something else. Mm. And then I had a couple clients come back to me and go, hey, did you know that this like makes your penis bigger? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, I, I, I was rocking my bathing suit today and like it's tight. Like my bulge is tighter. Or, you know, another guy's like, my girlfriend was like, holy shit, dude, like what <laughs> happened to you? You think you're rocking a Coke can, you know? <laughs> I was like, what? I had no idea. I was recommending it for people who needed to heal from an injury, actually. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the majority of people, like the 99.9% .9 of men actually use it to get those gains. And you do it for a little bit. It does take some time and consistency. But once you have the gains, and then you can just go back to just maintaining them. And most of my clients love it. So it's like, like going to the gym for your penis. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. it doesn't happen overnight. It does mm -hmm. take time, but once you have the games, you just maintain them. And you know the other thing I think is really good about the bath mate? Guys tend to have a relationship with their penis where they kind of use it like a tool. Actually, like literally, they, that is, they use it. Mm -hmm. It's not a relationship 
based on love, friendship, appreciation, gratitude, <laughs> right? It's a relationship based on like, what can you do for me? Mm-hmm. And, and can you do it as quick or slow, as hard or fast as, you know, like it's a relationship that's based on expectations and not appreciation, right? Mm, yeah. I think one thing that the fast mate does is it gives you an opportunity to actually just spend like five to 10 minutes a day, like with your penis in a way where you're not like beating it up, watching porn <laughs> or, or smashing it into somebody, else, right? Like it's a relationship that you actually get to cultivate. And it's the same with the gym, right? Mm-hmm. When you go to the gym, you, you develop a relationship with your body that's based on respect, yeah. right? Instead of just like hate, judgment, right? And a lot of the guys I work with, they have a really entitled, really judgmental relationship to their dick. Yeah. So that alone, I think, will give you gains, right? Whether they're physical or emotional or mental, like you're going to have a better relationship with your penis if you're spending 10 minutes a day being nice to him. <laughs> uh, it's not rocket science, but it does sound a little odd. Yeah. So I, I know I know there's 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 guys or there's going to be guys out there when they see this, they're they're going to be like, why should I take advice on a male body from a female? Yeah, I love that question. Well, just for starters, Mm -hmm. I have uh, been a bisexual, sexually active woman for two decades now, and Mm -hmm. I guarantee that I have seen a lot more penises than the average straight man. (laughs) You know, arguably, I have a lot more expertise because the average straight guy has had experience with one penis. Yeah. Right? Where I have personally seen and been with and experienced way more than that. Not to mention that I've been coaching men for seven years, too, so I have a lot of like expertise and in, in professionally. But, mm. you know, like, even just personally, like, why would you take advice from one guy who solved his one penis problem? <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. Like, what the heck does he... He doesn't have to solve it for him, right? Yeah. Uh, but my, my job as, a, as an educator, as a coach, as someone who loves and works with men... Uh, is to know all, about all of the variations of penis and all of the different types of male body and to figure out something that works for more than just one person. Yeah, that's true. So how much do you think the mental plays a part in good sex or any type of sexual experience? Because a lot of people well, think, well, you- hey, it gets hard. I can use it. It works. Totally, until, like, it doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. Until you're, like, 45, and suddenly you're, like, uh, <laughs> oh, what do I do now? Yeah. Because I've never had to think about it before, right? True. before, it just got hard, and I did the thing, and now I feel, um, you know, uh, uh, I have to, like, learn about our, my body for the first time ever, right? Yeah. A lot of guys come to me with erectile dysfunction. I just brought out a course called Hard As You Want that explains, like, how I work with ED so that people don't have to take meds, and, you know, guys that are in their 20s and 30s now are getting ED. So it's not like, it's not just an age-related thing anymore. It is a mental thing now. Uh, You know, a lot of the guys that I work with, again, going back to the analogy of using their dick as a tool, Mm -hmm. they like, you know, they get into bed with a new partner. Maybe it's like the first time that they're having sex with somebody and like their dick doesn't work or he's going, he he ejaculates too quickly or he can't get and stay hard. And he assumes it's just a physical thing. So maybe he like beats himself harder or, you know, applies more lube or whatever. But like, actually, if you take a couple deep breaths, Mm -hmm. which is a physical thing, right? Actually, if you like take a moment and maybe like trade massages with this woman or maybe, right? Like instead of, doing what we think we need to do, which is add more fuel to the fire. Think a sexy thought. Think about porn. Uh, 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 do some do something that's, like, kinky that gets me back into the game, right? Mm-hmm. Like, actually, dude, the way that your body works is you get hard when you're relaxed. That's why most men wake up with erections, because mm-hmm. you're the most relaxed that you've been all day. Mm-hmm. Right? You're relaxed. Your testosterone is high. Like, so much of what we need to do in terms of the mental game is get out of our heads on what, we're, what we think we know, right? Because we all have a story that, like, oh, this is how it works, right? And a lot of men think, like, this is how erections work. This is how bye-bye works. This is how sex works. But the truth is, if you can acknowledge that maybe you don't know what you don't know, Mm -hmm. right? And this is the hardest part for the guys that take my courses, usually. Yeah, because a lot of guys don't want to admit that. I mean, no man wants to admit that, right? Like, it is. It's counter to masculinity, our, our idea of like what makes a man a man, and mm-hmm. that he actually doesn't need to ask questions. Yeah. Right? He already has to know. He already has to know how to get directions. He can't 
ask questions about you know the sex that he's having with this woman because he's already supposed to know. He's already supposed yeah. to be free in bed. We're, we're, be like, as a man, we're we're the one that's used to giving the advice, not getting the advice. Right, and so it can be really hard to ask yeah. questions, right? Like, I think my body works this way. I have so many guys, especially with premature ejaculation, because that's where I started. I, I worked on premature ejaculation. I developed a whole methodology for it. It's like 98% effective. It works on almost every single guy. Uh, but what I, was, what I was realizing as I was working with guys with premature ejaculation is that they, they thought often that in order to get hard, you have to squeeze your pelvic floor, which is the muscle that you would squeeze to stop a flow of urine if you're peeing, right? Mm. But the truth is that if you squeeze those muscles frequently and hard enough, you create a lot of tension in your body, and you actually can prevent yourself from getting hard at all, mm. right? So they're thinking that in order to get hard, you have to squeeze, right? Mm. But actually, squeezing doesn't make you hard, right? It can, it, it can bring more blood into the area. It makes your dick bounce up and down, but it's not what makes you hard. Yeah. And so guys with premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, like sometimes when I just teach them how to actually relax their pelvic floor and quit getting so tense down there, that sometimes solves the entire problem that they came to me with. And if it doesn't solve it, it certainly moves them a lot closer to the solution. So, so since you brought that up, what tips would you give the other guys out there that are listening on the premature ejaculation? Like, how, what, what tips would you give them to slow it down or stop it? Or yeah, totally. So, don't listen to the advice that you've heard on like think about rotting meat or your grandmother's <laughs> underwear. Like, I promise you, this is not. I don't know where people. It works for somebody, right? And he was. Now people think that that's how you do it. But honestly, uh, I think think about the woman that you're with and how she would love to know that you're thinking about fucking rotting meat while you're inside of her. Yeah. Pass. <laughs> Hard pass. So actually, I would assume that that would counter it, counteract it to make you go soft, not just stop you from coming. <laughs> right. Also, like, that's not a long-term strategy because what you're going to have is every single time you yeah. night, Then you're going to get used to that picture and it ain't going to do shit. <laughs> that idea we don't let's get out of that way mm-hmm. uh so i actually my my system is body mind and your emotional uh like system right so in the body change the way that you masturbate so don't masturbate for less than 10 15 minutes if you're jerking off as fast as possible because you're afraid you're going to get caught or whatever you're going to come as quickly as possible when you're with a woman right mm-hmm. so that's how you're training your body right mm-hmm. so train your body so that you last uh, longer when you're solo, and yes, you actually do need to masturbate on a regular basis in order to last longer in bed with a woman. A lot of guys are resistant to that. They're like, well, I, should, I don't like masturbating. I just want to have sex, right? Well, consider that your training ground. The way that you masturbate is the way that you're going to have sex. The way that you practice is the way that you're going to play. So just go back to the fundamentals. Practice your free throws. Like, just <laughs> masturbate the right way, right? Mm-hmm. 10, 15 minutes. I also recommend that they masturbate without porn because you really want to learn your own body, right? And when you're watching porn, your, your mind and your body sort of like in the screen, right? So it's fine. Porn isn't bad. It just takes you away from noticing what the fuck is happening over here. Mm-hmm. So come back to here, figure out what's happening inside of you. And then, you know, 90 days later, you can go back to porn if you choose to. But you really have to break that habit if you want to perform better in bed with mm-hmm. a real woman. And that that's true for erectile dysfunction as well. So I have a whole bunch of other things that I would say like, about the body, but the next thing is you got to get your mind game right, right? So much of the tension that, you're, that, that you bring into the bedroom with you, tension around, like, I have to do it right, tension around getting rejected, tension around, you know, I, I secretly don't know what I'm doing, but I want to pretend that I do, or I'm afraid that I don't, right? <laughs> yeah. So you actually have to challenge your mind and the things that you tell yourself over and over and over again, and you've got to get that premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction are both made worse when we repeat the thought over and over to ourselves that it's going to happen again, right? You go soft one time, and all of a sudden you have this anxiety now, performance anxiety, right? They're like, oh, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. It's going to ha- oh, I came too quickly last time. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. When we tell ourselves that over and over and over again, we're training our brain to be like, well, okay, he wants to have, it's going to happen mm-hmm. again then, mm-hmm. right? Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you've got to get your mind right. And then finally, your emotional body. And this is something that men are sometimes a little reluctant to get into, but actually it's the biggest game changer. Because emotions are not a male or a female thing, right? Everyone has emotions. Mm -hmm. 
It's really not about the emotions themselves. It's really more like what you do with them that's masculine or feminine in nature. Mm-hmm. But a lot of men are spending so much time and energy trying not to have emotions, right? Yeah. Trying not to feel anything. And what ends up happening when it comes to sex, because sex is such a, it's a, it's a, it's a opening experience, it's a vulnerable experience. What ends up happening is they're spending their energy stifling stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it's robbing them of their ability to actually like give their energy into a sexual encounter. Mm. So sex becomes just this like explosion because it, it, it has to be because anything more than that would bring up too much stuff for them. So as long as you're taking care of your emotional well-being outside of sex, mm-hmm. it could be like, you know, signing up for Brazilian jiu-jitsu, like punching a bag, like it doesn't have to be therapy, yeah. right? But you have to be moving that energy mm-hmm. so that you can be present with your lover in bed so mm-hmm. that she can get the, the quality of you that isn't uh, uh, all the leftover shit from being stressed at work. Right? <laughs> of course it's gonna of course it's gonna affect how you feel. Yeah. So I have a whole system, it's called Come When You Want and I'm happy to share more about that with your listeners because that's where I like outline the whole system and that's the ninety eight percent effective. It only takes like eight weeks. You could be you lasting as long as you want in like two months. Done. True. It's not comp- it's actually very easy to fix. It's just that most people don't know how to do it. They actually have to take the time to actually want to do it. Right, and oh my god, like, what a gift. Your homework is to jerk off for 15 to 20 <laughs> minutes. Like, oh, it's tough life, you know? Yeah, some people think, you know, some people think they're the man, they could do it, you know. Yeah, and, 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 and like, you can do it. Men have that, 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 that bravado of, I'm the man, I can do whatever, until I'm they run into that problem and then... So let's say what let's give five tips you would give a guy that is struggling in the sex area. Well, I think we already hit on number one. Mm-hmm. It's just admit you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. You're, no one comes built with this. You didn't grow you didn't get fucking born knowing how to scramble eggs, right? Like you yeah. had to learn how to make pasta and how to drive and how to, you know, play soccer. You know, like, why is it that you think you should be born knowing how to be a great lover? I think all people are born knowing that they're hungry and that they want to eat, mm-hmm. right? But they're not born knowing how to cook. True. We're all born to become erotic. But we're all going to be horny yeah. at one point or another because it's in our DNA. But we're not born knowing how to have good sex. So there's nothing wrong with you. You're not supposed to know this stuff. Yeah. No one does, right? Some people are a little bit more gifted at They don't hand out a pamphlet. The There's, right, and the pamphlet that they hand out is like how not to get someone pregnant. Yeah. Right? It's not like how to have anal for the first time. They don't True. have that conversation. Right? True. I wish they did. So number one, admit that you don't know what you don't know. Number two, learn how to calm your nervous system down. Because a mm. lot of guys bring a ton of anxiety into bed with them, performing things that the need to, to perform, pressure to perform, right? And, like, we love that about you, right? I love that about men. I love how deeply they desire to perform and mm. show up and, like, you know. But if you're doing that from a place of pressure and anxiety, you're, you're not really in bed with that woman. You're mm. in bed with your anxiety. Yeah. And she happens to be there, right? True. So that is, like, breathing. That's, that, you know, this, I say I come back to breathing because it's just a fucking simple right i i it sounds a little woo woo it may sound new agey but like it fucking works you know you have to breathe eat sleep right so go to the bathroom before you have sex and take five rounds of deep breaths with slow exhales Mm -hmm. so i like to do inhale for four three two one hold for seven exhale for eight and just do that at least five times see a lot of a lot of people use like the alcohol or they'll smoke or like, do you recommend any of those or is it more mental than any of that? I mean, I want you to be able to use those, but I don't want you to rely on them. Mm-hmm. Just like I don't want you to rely on Viagra. You yeah. Know? Cause like, what if you're out with your partner and you're, I don't know, a, in a situation and things get a little frisky and mm-hmm. you want to use some privacy and you want to like be able to uh, perform right then and there and you don't have, Weed, or you don't have alcohol, you don't have, you always have your ability to breathe, right? Mm-hmm. 100% of the time. Um, and you can invite her to breathe with you. You can just be like, hey, babe, let's, do you want to just take like five deep breaths together, like really sync up? 
like mm-hmm. really feel each other. Like I guarantee that might sound hokey, but most women are going to be like, oh, oh, sure, okay, I'll try. You know, and it it settles both of your nervous systems because like, well, look at we're, we're, it's the twenty first century, right? Like we work hard, we play hard, we watch TV, we sleep. We don't really, most of us, don't really chill. We yeah. have like deep chill time, right? Like deep, really, really meaningful. Rest I actually time. relax. But yeah, one thing you got to get about how your body works is that we have, uh, in short, we have two different nervous systems that control uh, the way that we're operating in the world. It's actually way more complicated than that, but just for purposes of our conversation, let's just say there's two. And we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is the fight or flight nervous system, right? It's mm-hmm. what moves us when there's danger. It's what, it's what causes our heart to race and our skin to flush. And that's what gives us stress. But stress is good, right? We need some stress. Like if someone comes at you with a knife, you want your adrenaline <laughs> yeah. to kick in. You want to start moving fast, right? Yeah. The parasympathetic nervous system is called the feed and breed nervous system. Breed as in have sex, right? And that is the nervous system that is uh, slows our heart rate, slows our breathing, uh, allows us to digest our food, allows us to sleep really and that's the nervous system that gives us erections and orgasms, right? Mm-hmm. So most of us are living in fight or flight, like all the time, because we're stressed about work, we're stressed about money, we're stressed about you name it, right? And I'm guilty of this for sure. Like I, I, I know all of this stuff, and I still live in fight or flight all the time. And you know you're in fight or flight because you're, you're, you know, you're not focused on you get peripheral vision, your tunnel vision. You're focused only on what's in front of you or what's stressing you out, and you can't breathe and you can't sleep really well. That's fight or flight. The thing about fight or flight is that when your body's in that, it moves all of the blood to your hands and your feet in case you need to punch and fight for your life or you need to run, mm-hmm. right? All the blood moves away from your brain, your heart, your digestive tract, your stomach, and your cock or pussy, depending on who we're talking mm-hmm. about. In rest and digest nervous system, it actually pulls all the blood back to the center line of the body. Mm-hmm. Right? Again, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but like I use this because it really just helps to demonstrate the point. You want the blood in the middle of your body. If you want to get hard, if you want to stay hard, if you want to perform, if you want to have orgasms, if you want her to have orgasms, you have got to get back into the parasympathetic nervous system. And the more that you can learn about what helps you get there, whether that's deep breaths, whether that's you know going on a, a jog to get all the extra energy out, taking a shower, um, working on like a you know doing some slow movement, dancing to music. It, it doesn't have to be complicated mm. like for most of us. It's uh, we're actually meant to do this. We actually evolved to do this. But when we don't give ourselves the time to actually do it, we're just trying to perform from fight or flight. Yeah. And you're not going to get the results that you want. Like, yeah, when you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s even, sure, you can get hard and you can get off. You can. It doesn't mean you're going to have the best sex you possibly can. So that's my second tip. Let's see. Third tip. I say third tip, learn about anatomy. And learn about female anatomy, too, mm-hmm. because there's five different points in the, uh, uh, in the uh, vulva and vagina of erectile tissue. So men really have two parts of erectile tissue, the left and the right side of the penis, right? Mm-hmm. And they fill up with blood, and that's that. But the, uh, the female body, the, the, the vulva vagina, have five different parts, and they're spread out sort of in a circle. Mm-hmm. And so if you really want to be an excellent lover, learn how to touch all five of them. Learn how to turn on all five of them, especially during foreplay, because then you're going to get the, you know, the orgasms, the, the, the longevity, the sex, the time that she can go you know, uh, into sex and, and the pain and the, or like the lack of pain and heightened pleasure. Like if you learn this stuff, you only have to learn it one time and then figure out how each individual body responds to it. Mm-hmm. But when you learn uh, anatomy, like you, you actually are able to uh, uh, approach. It's like it's, it's like driving a car. Like if you don't really know how the car works, you don't really know the difference between park and reverse. Or you can do a new car and you actually don't know where the the to, the gear shift. Yeah. Right. Or, like how are you? You're not going to be able to drive very well. True. Right. Like you gotta just you just learn the equipment that you're working. With, you know? <laughs> uh, number four would be learn your own equipment, and I mean this like masturbate thoughtfully because you are practicing for sex whenever mm. you masturbate. So a lot of guys get into this habit of, I'm stressed out, so I jerk off. I'm bored, so I jerk off. Um, I had a sexy thought, so now I'm turning on porn and tuning out and jerking off. Mm -hmm. I think that you should be masturbating 
just in a way that's like a little bit more thoughtful. You know, think about like porn and stress masturbation as sort of like fast food. Mm-hmm. You can a hundred percent you can survive on McDonald's or whatever every single day, but you're probably over the weeks, months, years, decades of doing that, you're probably going to get some results that don't make you very happy. True. And not actually what you're looking for, right? Like you want to have a, a, a good health and a specific type of body. Like you know, you got to take care of your shit, right? Mm-hmm. Think about masturbation in the same way. Think about that as your opportunity to actually do something that's really good for you. It's like taking your vitamins. It's like making yourself a meal instead of hitting fast food. And again, like I'm, I'm not saying something that uh, I'm necessarily the best at, right? Like I don't love cooking for myself. I love just getting out my vibrator and having like three or four quick orgasms and just being like, oh, okay, back to work. You know, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it. But I recommend if you want to be a great lover. To develop a masturbation habit that is just you, some lube, maybe a sex toy, like a, 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 a flesh a flashlight or another stroker because you want to emulate the feeling of a woman's body and not mm-hmm. your hand. Right? Yeah. Women's body doesn't feel like your hand, right? So it's a stroker. It's not that big of a fucking deal. Women have been buying sex toys. The, the Egyptians used dildos. Like, it's okay. We can all have sex toys now, right? Like, men can have sex toys. It's yeah. not weird. Don't make it weird. Uh, so masturbate consciously masturbate in a way that you're taking care of your body masturbate in the same way that you like cook yourself a healthy meal or take yourself to the gym or whatever else that you do but, but I can't what's the fifth tip what do you think what do you think fifth tip if you're in a relationship I would say know your partner know what she likes know what actually gets her to that orgasm because if you just like you said, if you go in not knowing anything, you're just doing it for yourself. Ooh. Yeah, I would say ask questions. Yeah. Because again, if you feel like you have to know it all. Because a lot of people, a lot of a lot of guys, they go in there thinking I'm the man. I could do this. I know what I'm doing. And then she may fake it. She may not. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think you know one thing that my one of my coaches says to me is like failure is an option. Right? We live in this world, and I'm guilty of it, where failure is not an option. Yeah. And so we have to always be succeeding, or else we feel like we're not enough. We're not mm-hmm. worthwhile, right? True. But like, actually failing is the way that you get better. If you've ever started a business, if you've ever had a relationship, like, I've failed in plenty of relationships. Yeah. I'm very happily married now. Yeah. But I got here because I failed at a bunch of relationships. Yeah. Right? And so did he. And that's how we did it. Everybody fails right? at some point. We finally succeeded. Let yourself fail. Let yourself recognize that you're a beginner. Even if you're 40, 50 years old, like you can still have a beginner mindset and ask questions. And one of my favorite pieces of advice that comes to me from my mentor, Jaya, is like test, A, B, test. So ask her, do you like this touch? And then make a small change. Or do you like this touch? Did you like touch one or touch two? Did you like touch A or touch B? Mm-hmm. And then she doesn't have to, you know, a lot of people ask like, well, do you like that? Do you want more of it? Do you want it harder? Right? What do you want is like the worst questions, you, one of the worst questions you can ask because you're giving someone like all of the opportunity, like every option is on the table mm-hmm. and now you have to choose from all of those. It's like asking them like, well, what do you want to go for dinner? Like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Cause yeah. We can choose from anything, right? Yeah. So many I options know, out there. I can, I can have any type of food in 20 minutes. Like, I don't know, but give me some parameters. Like, yeah. Are we going in? Are we staying out? Is it takeout? How much money do we want to spend? Like when you have that kind of specificity, you can make a decision. We often go to our partner and we go like, so tell me what you like in bed. Tell me how you like to be touched. Tell me what it is that you want. These are good questions. You should ask them. But once you're actually in bed with somebody, instead of asking, do you like that? Do you want more? Ask, do you like this touch or this touch? Do you mm-hmm. like when I do this with my tongue? Mm-hmm. Or do you like when I do this with my tongue? Right? Which one do you like more? Which one do you like more? Which one do you like more? That's actually the best way for you to get the kind of information that you need to be epic. Without making her think too much and get into her brain, oh my god, you know, what do I like more? Is it like this? How do I describe that? Oh, I kind of like the thing my ex did, but I want to tell him that. <laughs> yeah, that might kill the mood. It would kill the mood. <laughs> <laughs> so, scrolling through your videos again, I see where to go, where to go. Okay, yeah, help the guys out there to, and you can help the females too if you know that side of the spectrum on. There, you said there's five types of women that'll cheat on you. So let yeah. let the let the guys know what what signs to look for. 
Well, you'll have to go watch the video because I really do a deep dive into each of the five. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that there's just five, right? Like, those are the five that I've found describe everybody. Everybody could fall into one of those categories, mm -hmm. right? And the categories vary from someone who is uh, um, who's reluctant to commit. Right, mm -hmm. who, who says one thing and does another, so they don't have a lot of integrity. Right, uh, someone who's bounced from relationship to relationship to relationship, uh, someone who's really insecure, really deeply feels like they're not enough, who always needs to be getting more attention, more validation from mm -hmm. you and other people in order to feel worthy, and they never like actually feel worthy for very long. But what I'll say is that the thing that they all have in common is that they all have tells, right? And most guys know it. I think, anyways, they. Know because a woman, they just you know, don't want to believe it. Just, they don't want to believe it. Yeah. They want to think they're going to be special. Oh, she cheated on every other boyfriend she's ever I had. I could change her. Your ass is special. See, she's different now. Or, you know, she's telling you that she doesn't want to be in a serious relationship, but you don't want to hear that because you really like her. And so even though, you know, she hasn't committed to being monogamous with you, you've made up a story that she is, and then you get upset when she goes and has sex with somebody else, and she's like, oh, dude, I never promised you I wouldn't. Yeah. You know? You got in your head and said that that was the case. Or, you know, a lot of guys, my coaching clients especially, they try to help someone feel secure, right? So maybe their girlfriend feels insecure about her body, about her education, about her, you know, physical attractiveness. And so they just try to, like, pump her up. Mm -hmm. Like, they're trying to fix it, right? Yeah. But actually, you're, you're pouring time and energy. And I'm not saying never tell her that she's attractive. I'm saying don't see her as a project that you're going to fix. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're not. Take care of yourself. Maintain your own boundaries. Maintain your own sense about you. And then, when if she acts out, and it could be cheating, that could be a lot of different things, right? Then you're not completely caught off guard because you haven't been obsessed with fixing her. You've stayed in your own lane. Mm -hmm. You've been taking care of yourself, and you're way more apt to be able to identify, you know, little idiosyncrasies in their behavior. I don't know if it was your podcast. I think it was, where someone was on recently saying, like, women are better at cheating than men. Yeah, we hear that a lot. Yeah. 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 And that's, that, that unfortunately is the case, but we also got to get that it's not just because women are better at hiding stuff, it's because men are lying to themselves. Mm. Right. Okay, okay, okay. So do you think that advice would help on the, the women's side, too, for the men? Because, you know, you always get, like you said with the with the men, how... They like don't look at me as a project because there's a lot of women. We have women on here, or even talking to different women. They say oh, they get that mentality of oh, I could change him. Like even though they know he's been a cheater, he's always been a cheater, and they always get in their head like oh, I'm the woman that could change him. Right. Yeah, it's funny. You know, they say that men get into relationships with women hoping that they won't change, mm -hmm. and women get into relationships with men hoping that they'll change them. Yeah. And, like, it's not exactly, we all change, right? Hopefully. Yeah. Anyways, like, I've changed a lot uh, in my marriage, especially. I've grown a lot, and so has he. So we're not the same people that we get together. Mm -hmm. so neither one of us is. But one thing I'll say is that we have this cultural association with cheating as if it is, like, the worst possible thing that could happen to a relationship. Like, I think we, we put relationships, like, or rather, we put cheating on the level of, like, murder in a relationship, yeah. right? We're like, oh, my God, she cheated on you. Mm -hmm. You got to dump her ass. You got to end the relationship. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's unrealistic. Like, up to one, well, studies vary, but at least one quarter of people are cheated on or cheat on someone in their lifetime, and I actually think it's way higher than that. Yeah, yeah, I would assume I it is. people cheat and get cheated on. Yeah, you know? I mean, there's very f actually, different forms of cheating, too, so... Exactly. So yeah. I think we need to loosen up our definition around cheating and like really get clear on what counts as cheating in our own relationship because each relationship is going to have a very different standard of what counts as cheating. Right? True. For me, what I care more about, it's not so much what you do. I care about how you do it. Mm -hmm. So you, you, so you have interest in somebody. Okay. Well, are you going behind my back and flirting with them and talking with them and hiding it from me, or do you come to me and say, "Oh my God, I like I kind of have a crush on your friend." Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm not going to necessarily you know, do anything about it. I might not be supportive of it, but just, like, let me know that that's happening, right? See, I think a lot of people are scared to, to do that or to take that step because they're afraid of losing what they have, already have. Right, so instead they cheat, hoping that they're not going to lose Hoping they don't have. get caught, yeah. Exactly. But to me, just, like, you know, having, I have 
cheated on someone in the past and uh, it just ate away at me. Yeah. Like, I didn't feel good keeping a secret from this person who I was, you know, also dating and also cared very deeply for. And I only really had, it only had to do it one time and feel the weight of lying to this person mm-hmm. to be like, you know what, this doesn't work for me. I'm going to figure something else out. Because a lot of, uh, yeah. I'll go ahead, go ahead. It takes a lot. It yeah. takes a lot. You have to be like really good at communicating. You have to really check your ego. You know, you have to feel really secure for someone to come to you and be like, oh, I kind of want to make out with your friend. Yeah. I kind of want to make out with this girl that I'm mm-hmm. I kind of want to like, would, would, would that be okay with you? Can we talk about it? Like what boundaries, requests, conditions would you put in place? Do you want to be able to make out with people? Like, you know, we, but we treat, we treat it like, uh, the relationship has to be dead and buried. I think a lot of the times we just throw the baby out with the bathwater because someone like flirted with someone when they were a little drunk. And like, I don't think that we should be throwing out relationships because we're human. Yeah. I think we should throw out relationships because we're not being honest with each other. That, that, that's what I was getting to. Cause we, we get a lot of, uh, women in here that say, you know, tell me the truth. I, I'd rather you be honest with me, but then we give them a scenario and they can't handle the truth. So that makes the guy not want to tell him the truth because they can't right, handle yeah. the truth. It's so, no, it's very common. It is unfortunately probably the most common is that you know we want people to be honest with us, but we also want to live with our fantasy of who that person is. Mm-hmm. When we when we get real about it and we get confronted, any of our insecurities, our fear of not being enough, it's going to be front center. It's going to show up, right? You gotta, if you're willing to deal with it, then you're going to have a great life ahead of you. If you're constantly running from whatever makes you feel insecure and believing that the next guy or the next relationship is going to be different, like it's not until you change, every relationship that you're in is going to be the same. Mm-hmm. So how much do you think that the this new social media wave has impacted the like a healthy sexual experience? You think it's made it better? You think it's made it worse? I want to add one more. I want to add one more note on the previous conversation, which mm-hmm. is that I do want people to speak with discernment. You do not have to. You have a crush on somebody. You don't always have to tell your partner, your lover. Right? Yeah. You can just have that crush. I crush all the time. I'm a big crusher. Mm-hmm. I happen to tell my spouse a lot of the time when I have a crush and he laughs at me, but like if he couldn't take it, I wouldn't tell him. Right? Yeah. I would only tell him in the instance of like, there's something that's going to happen. I want to make something happen. There's an opportunity to make something happen. I feel conflicted about wanting to make this happen. Mm-hmm. That's what I would tell him. You don't have to use your discernment. You don't have to say every single thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, but if you give permission, if they say like, you know what, that's fine. Make out with whoever you want. Just don't tell me about it. Like, consider if that actually will work. For you in the long run, or if you're going to feel like you're hiding something. Yeah. Uh, and I think this segues right into the question about social media because I think we have never before had the amount of choice. As it, it's not real choice; it's it's um, it's a illusion of choice mm-hmm. because of social media, right? Like we have the illusion that we can choose from anyone, we could be with anyone, we can we can flirt with or interact with or engage or form a relationship with more people because there's tinder there's an endless supply yeah the the accessibility is right in your hand yeah there's always more Mm -hmm. so we don't take as good a care of the person who's right in front of us because we have the illusion that there's just more and more and more and more and an endless supply of potential Mm -hmm. partners I think that's impacted social. That, that's been one of the major impacts of social media on relationships. I also think that the way that men and women are putting uh, the way that we're expected to show up in these spaces, mm-hmm. you know, the way that people are expected to share that they do share, like I think it it separates us from what's actually true for us because we're all trying to fit into like a mold, right? We want to look a certain way on social media. We want to appear to have these qualities or these traits or this money or whatever. Yeah. And I think it gets us away from just like really being truthful about who we are and what we want because we're all trying to like chase something that isn't even what we decided we wanted. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the social media has, I don't want to say kill, but in a sense killed relationships because now you get this whole hookup culture that's going around where everybody's just wanting to hook up and not invest in an actual relationship. 
I think there's some truth to that. I also think that people have been hooking up for a long time, so yeah. I think for like promiscuity and like yeah. spontaneous sex. And but now you can actually see it because of social media. So right, and now we have more access. It's mm-hmm. a easier to arrange, right? Mm-hmm. Before you had to like go to a bar and talk to people. You know, now it's just like you can hop on and be like, "Hey, do you want to come over and park? Like, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, it's a lot easier. But I think it's always existed. I actually, I have a lot of mixed feelings on hookup culture because, like, I'm a millennial. I was part of hookup culture. I graduated for, I went to college in, like, the uh, 20 teens, like, mm-hmm. or, um, or rather, like, sorry, not the teens, the noughts, right, the zeros. So we were, like, we were we were hookup culture at its peak. We were we were definitely, like, the, the nasty, I think, anyways, from my interpretation, like, we were the sluttiest generation because now uh, uh, the, uh, people who are going into college today in the current generation like they're actually having much less sex yeah. despite the fact that and all the all the studies are showing this they're having way less sex way less partners they're maybe connecting over social media more but they're not connecting in bed quite so much right yeah so i think that the people in my generation who are now in their mid-30s we're, we're able to settle down and have kids have relationships get married like you know a lot of the people who i know are invested in relationships and we all sort of got to scratch this itch in our teens and 20s like i was in my early 20s like i I felt like i i got to have all the hookup all the hooking up that i wanted Mm -hmm. you know i i never i never felt like um i was doing anything that was going to negatively impact my ability to form a relationship to get married to have a family one day Mm -hmm. and that is still that has remained my experience. Like I think we should have the opportunity to like scratch all of our itches, you know, without to feel bad, without being slut shamed, without being made wrong for it, without being judged for it. And there's there's been a quote going around on the internet that's like the more men that a woman sleeps with, the less uh, neuro bonding capacity she has, right? Mm. And it's actually that is a bastardized quote that was sort of taken from a study that says something very different. <laughs> but someone took that one quote, they, you know, kind of made it fit into a clickbaity conversation, right? Yeah. And now, unfortunately, a lot of people believe that, but it's actually like it's not based in truth. We're designed, we evolved to have a lot of sexual partners. Mm-hmm. That is in our DNA, right? That, that is how we got here. We remix our genetics with a lot of different people, you know, usually two or three over the course of a lifetime. Yeah. Right? That's what made our genes strong and competent and made us the apex predator that we are. Like, you're meant to have sex. You're meant to have sex with multiple people over the course of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like, I think for most people, that's what they find to be the most satisfying thing. But you're also meant to grow. You're also meant to evolve. You're also meant to mature. And most people, when they mature, determine that sex is less important than partnership and creating and building something. And as long as you're able to make that switch in your brain because you're maturing, mm-hmm. then I think that you will be able to have it all in one lifetime. So you don't think body sh- body count should be held against you if you have a high volume of body count? Well, I, don't, I think it's only held against women. Mm-hmm. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's maybe not exactly true. There's plenty. I mean, I, I've, I've been a judgmental person. You know, I've been... Oh, you've just been giving it away. <laughs> uh, so I certainly have judged men, um, and men I've dated for that. But I really think high body counts primarily held against women. I think most men have an idea that they want a woman who's like really freaky, but she's only theirs. Yeah. Right? She's never been with anyone else. Like she's super freaky and sexually skilled, but she just came by that like you know, she's born that way, right? Like she yeah. just appeared that way. You know, you want someone who is advanced, who's able to uh, have great sex with you, who's able to relate, to communicate with you. Like, practicing with other people is one of the ways that we get there. What I think happens to men, in particular, is that they don't want to confront those insecurities. Again, going back to our original conversation, men just want to get in there and, like, I know what's up. I don't need to uh, I don't need to practice. I don't need to learn anything. I don't need to read a book on this. Like, I've got it. Mm-hmm. Right? But if any man has done that work, he read a book, he practiced, he knew what was going on, right? Yeah. And she slept with that guy. Now you're confronted with the, the fact that you might not be the best because you refuse to ask the questions because asking that made you feel insecure about yourself and your manhood. Right? See, a lot, a lot of guys can't handle that knowing that they weren't the best, especially if they're in a relationship with a girl. Right, but then ironically, they won't fucking do anything to become the best. True. Right? They, won't, True. they, they just want to be the best without putting any effort in. Mm-hmm. And they want to shame women for sampling other men because they don't want to actually have to really compete with other men, Mm -hmm. right? And then they get into their head that it's about dick size. It's about 
all these things that they actually can't control. But it's actually not. You, you can control probably 80% of everything that makes you good in bed, you can control and practice and get better at. But again, they don't want to acknowledge that that's possible, so mm-hmm. they'd rather just be the only one she's ever been with, so she doesn't have anything to compare them to. Yeah. So do you think size matters? Size is one. Size matters, but so do a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. So if someone, if someone is on the, the, the small spectrum, if someone is on the small spectrum, is there ways that they can make it better to yeah. spice it up or, or keep the girl in? Totally. Well, you know, and, and like I said, we can add the bathmate, uh, which can increase girth and length over time. <laughs> but I actually think that, yeah, and you need to remember that Size matters for women, too. Not all vaginas are shaped the same, mm-hmm. right? So like, there's as much variety in penises as there are in vaginas, right? Some women have really shallow vaginal canals. I'm talking like three to four inches. They're, they're small vaginas, mm-hmm. right? Some women have big, deep vaginal canals. They're seven to nine inches, right? So, so it doesn't work that like all women prefer a specific size or shape or girth of penis. Mm-hmm. Some women prefer straight penises, some prefer curved penises. It has a lot to do with where your G-spot is. It has a lot to do with where your cervix is. It has a lot to do with how shallow your canal is. There's so much going on. And I really believe, like, there's a lid for every jar. You know? <laughs> like, there really is. Like, there's a, there's a vagina shape for every penis. Like, it's yeah. like, you know, they're, 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 the variety, it all adds up mathematically, I think. That said, if you are on the smaller side, or even if you're on the average, even if you're big, you know, one of the worst things about guys with big penises is that they're lazy in bed. Because they just think they got this dick and, like, you're supposed to be fortunate to be with them. I hear this complaint from women all the time. He had a big dick, but, like, after having sex with him a couple of times, it was fucking boring because he didn't know how to use it. Mm-hmm. You know, so they collect him like a trophy and move on. And actually, I don't think that that's, that that's using him as an object. That's objectifying him. Like, we don't mm-hmm. want men to do this to women. We don't want women to do that to men, right? Yeah. Just body count just for the sake of body count, right? Oh, yeah, I did. I slept with that big dick. Like, all right, like, well, here's your trophy, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think that guys should learn all, and do all the things that we discussed earlier because you can be an incredible lover and not be, you know, genetically that gifted. Mm-hmm. Like, 80% of it is something that you can, you can learn and get better at. So shut down your mental blocks and actually expand your mind and have the willingness to learn your body. Have the willingness to learn. Yeah, recognize that you don't know what you don't know. Porn isn't capable of teaching you how to have great sex. It's just capable of entertaining you. It's not the same. Right? You've got to go out there and get educated by someone or something else. It doesn't have to be me. I have like 500 videos on YouTube. You can start mm-hmm. there. They're free. I you know. I have the courses, my Come When You Want, my Heart As You Want course. Like, you, It doesn't take that much. In a matter of weeks, you can learn pretty much everything you need to know to actually have a really good foundation. And then every other sexual experience you have from then, you can just be learning and honing your craft. You know, you wouldn't go into a, a martial arts class tomorrow and just expect that you know all the moves. You get your ass kicked. Yeah, but right? unfortunately, you know there's I mean? some guys out there that think they would be able to, oh, I'm bigger than him, I could beat his ass. Totally, and then right? get beat up. You, you think, yeah, and you go, I bet, go get your ass kicked and find out, right? <laughs> Failure is an option. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's not about your worthiness as a man. It's not about your ego. It's not about whether you're good enough or whether you... Uh, you know, whether you have hope or, or whether you are going to um, be seen as worthwhile in the eyes of a woman. Like, don't rely on her inexperience to make you feel worthy, right? It doesn't have to be like that. You actually are more capable. That's my message for men in the end is you are so much more capable than you're giving yourself credit for. Mm-hmm. Let yourself be a student and the results will amaze. Be willing to learn. Yeah. Be willing to learn. So before we close it out, is there any advice that we haven't touched on that you want to give the women or the men that you think they should know? I would say pretty much everything I said to men applies to women on some level. Mm-hmm. Uh, the distinction for the advice I would give to women is be less concerned about your performance and learn um, how to give really good feedback to your partner. Mm -hmm. So many of us are afraid of telling our partner the truth, that it actually doesn't feel that good, or, you know, I don't really like it like that, or, you know, your oral sex game actually isn't that tight. Like, it's hard. It's really difficult. No one wants to say that. I don't think anyone really likes 
to say that. Let's yeah. just kind of get off on hurting people's feelings, you know? Yeah. Uh, which is a different conversation. You know? Yeah, yeah. It isn't really the problem. If that's what you're getting off on, it's something totally different. <laughs> but I would say a lot of women get caught up in how they look and how they're performing, and so they actually miss the pleasure of sex, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes you've got to be like, we need to slow down. Also for women, never, ever, ever, ever force anything to go inside of you if you're not ready, okay? Now, we, that's not just like from a consent to the day perspective. When we talk to people, women who are older and they can't have sex because it's too painful, mm-hmm. their body is locked up. They have undiagnosed, unexplainable pain, just vulvodynia, vaginismus, all of this stuff. It tends to result from having sex that your body wasn't ready to have. Mm-hmm. And so... It's not about today. Today, yeah, for sure. You could just force it in, grab some lube, it's fine. You can make do. He's hard, he's hard. he needs to go right now. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, right? Mm-hmm. You stack that up over months and years and decades and you're setting yourself up to not be able to have sex at all mm-hmm. or to have such pain with sex or to have such pain in giving birth mm-hmm. that you're actually really screwing yourself over in the long run. So men, don't masturbate in a way that you wouldn't want to have sex in when you're 50. And women, don't force stuff inside of your body because you're going to pay for that later if you're not careful. Okay, okay, okay. And men, don't push either, right? Because it's like that. that you want her to still be having sex with you at 50? Like, don't push it today. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel we had a, a pretty informative uh, show. I hope so. Oh, no, uh, yeah. I- Hopefully, you know, these people out here that take notes on this and actually do some research and invest the time on opening up mentally. And, and like I said, like, come learn from me. I'm, all the content that I make is specifically for Yeah, go, go ahead and um, shout out your, um, your, your shows and everything you have yeah. to offer. So you can find me on YouTube at Caitlin B. That's C-A-I-T-L-I-N-B. Uh, oh, you can spell my name any which way. It'll still come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I have multiple courses that I designed for men to help them last longer, to get harder. I also have a course, uh, a Legendary Lover, that's just foreplay, seduction, sex itself in Africa. So I, I literally take you by the hand and show you how to be a great lover so you don't have to figure it out for yourself. Coming out with a course on erotic massage right now so that you can like really use your fingers to make a woman have bigger, more powerful orgasms, uh, especially if they never had orgasms before mm-hmm. that's typical for them you can also check out my show on max which is the new discovery plus hbo max it's called max now it just mm-hmm. came out yesterday uh and the show's called good sex and you can watch me literally coach couples uh you can watch them actually have sex but i coach them and then you get to watch them like actually take that coaching into their bedroooms mm-hmm. uh all of you can get a 70 70- trial for free of max you can get any of my courses at a 90 day money back guarantee because i want you to go Try it. Yeah. Prove it that it works. You know, take the rest of the summer or whatever season it is when you hear this. Try it out. If it doesn't work, no problem. Like money back, it's fine. No, no skin off my back. Right? <laughs> Try it out. And if and if you don't want to invest, of course, check out all of the free content that I put up at YouTube. Uh, yeah, Caitlin B. All right, you hear that, everybody? Make sure you guys check her out. She knows what she's talking about. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Thank you for coming. All right, this is BBC, another podcast, and we're out.